Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final session of the Global Fleet Conference 2020. Indeed, it's our final session from the 2nd of June until today, we have been discussing a variety of topics linked to global fleet management in these extraordinary times. We hope we have been able to support you and your organization in getting prepared for the new normal. We would like to thank our sponsors for making this first virtual conference such a success and we are very grateful also to our expert speakers for their input and of course to you, our audience, for the keen interest and your participation. I think it is safe to say that the road to the new normal will be quite bumpy with a possible challenge waiting around every corner. It is also clear to see that the pandemic has impacted businesses and regions in very different ways and to different extents. And one of the regions that is currently heavily affected by the pandemic is Latin America. In today's session, we want to have a look at how to prioritize your Latin fleet management in the new normal. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you five true LATAM experts. First, we have Rodrigo Monroy of Novartis, and in this panel, the voice of the LATAM fleet customer. Carlos Castillo of technology company Geotap. Ricardo de Bol of Arval, and representing the alliance element Arval. Pascal Serre of Global Fleet, and the chairman of the fleet LATAM advisory board. And finally, Kent Biertrup of ALD Automotive. Gentlemen, welcome, welcome in this panel. I hope that you are doing fine. For several years, Latin America has been witnessing a steady development of fleet management, leasing and outsourcing best practices. Many global fleet managers, having already optimized their fleet management strategy in Europe and North America, have been shifting their focus to LATAM. But the LATAM continent is more than one country. It has challenging economic and financial volatility issues and the current pandemic is of course causing a dent within the fleet maturity curve. Therefore, it's more than relevant to examine how global and regional fleet decision makers need to prioritize their LATAM fleet management in the new normal. So, of course, we need first of all to talk about the impact of the pandemic. And I would like to ask a first question to Rodrigo Monroy of Novartis. Um, Rodrigo, as you are the fleet customer in this panel, can you describe the current impact of the pandemic on vehicle fleet management in Latin America? Sure, Steven. First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here with you. And well, uh, obviously the, this pandemic affected us all. Uh, uh, regarding fleet and in Latin America, uh, the uncertainty that the pandemic brings, uh, it's huge. Uh, we, if we had this strategy in our uh, fleet, uh, probably it, it's not uh, that anymore. For example, the first impact was uh, we, we needed to go back to our homes to stay safe. Our uh, fleet users uh, also had to do the same. So the first uh, impact is we need to stay away from the roads. It impacted the sales, sales division. And regarding also a fleet, probably it could uh, impact us uh, regarding the delivery of the cars. If we had certain uh, delivery vehicles for our sales reps, new renewals, it stopped. So uh, we didn't receive any cars in the last months. Also, the maintenance couldn't be possible. And uh, the, the plan for the future changed. We know the the face to face meetings uh, are no longer uh, possible now. In the future, will be less. So to change the way that we see our fleet, uh, the, the way we see our fleet program, and adapt to this new new ways of working to this new normal. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. A question for Ricardo de Bol of Arval. Ricardo, how challenging is the fact that not all LATAM countries are taking the same measures 
precautions to conquer the pandemic. I can imagine for a regional fleet manager, this is a challenge. Yes, indeed, it is a, it is a pretty good challenge, Stephen. Uh, actually, uh, within Alamantarval, we see that this is the pandemic is a reflect. It reflects also uh, the maturity of those countries, and uh, it differs from country to country. In Peru, for example, we expect to have uh, the production of new vehicles will be uh, below 50% if compared to, to last year. Uh, in Brazil, we see the increase of numbers of uh, COVID-19 cases uh, climbing a lot. And this brings a lot of uncertainties on, for example, uh, residual values, interest rates, the time of delivery of a vehicle, uh, when a car stops to go to a garage, uh, how much time it will take, and for sure, uh, also uh, when uh, we have one vehicle that stops, we need to be very uh, cautious about sanitation, because this is one of the main concerns, and this it is it differs from much from country to country. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kent, uh, you are working and living uh, in Mexico. Uh, can you detail a little bit what the current impact is in that country for fleet? Yes, thanks a lot, Stephen. Yeah, so, so in Mexico, uh, similar to many of the other countries in the region, of course, we also impacted uh, about the pandemic here. Uh, I would say uh, Mexico have had a more, let's say, a flexible uh, approach to this. They have not, the government have not forced uh, customers uh, to stay at home necessarily. They have not forced workshops to 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 close down. At ALD, we have had approximately 50% of of the cars uh, running. We have done 50% of of maintenance. We can still do maintenance of the cars. In fact, it has more been a matter of of you know to register the new cars, to deliver the new cars to our customers, also take the let's say when the contracts expire, to take the cars back and do do the re de registration. So there has been some, let's say, some, some challenges, of course, that we have to overcome, and it, it's certainly not over yet. We still have, you know, some some weeks and maybe a month ahead of us before things will start to return to normal. Uh, but you know, we service our clients. Our clients they need uh, they need us, and our suppliers they also are there for us. So so I think uh, we have. It's not perfect, but I think we have dealt uh, with with the situation in the best possible manner. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to go back to Rodrigo. Rodrigo, um, a question that many fleet managers have is, of course, linked to the possibility of harmonizing your fleet across Latin America. How easy or difficult is it to harmonize your fleet across Latin America in these conditions and why? Well, in it's definitely possible to harmonize the, your fleet in Latin America. Uh, however, a fleet, a fleet program is uh, complex. So probably we would have to divide the program internally. So internally, you can have the internal policy, vehicle, cars that you use, period of use, what you can uh, control internally. Uh, what is very important in this aspect is to have a good communication with your stakeholders in the different countries to have a communication with HR, finance, even general managers, to let them know what is the objective of having uh, your fleet program, the benefit you will receive, uh, because you will need their, their buy-in to have a successful fleet program. And also you need to harmonize uh, the services that you receive. You know that uh, it, it goes from the OEMs, the cars that you, the leasing companies or the fleet management companies that you select. Luckily, uh, those two vendors have now regional coverage and you can find them uh, practically in all of the countries. Even a leasing company that doesn't operate in all of the countries can, if it's a global one, can have uh, partners that operate in smaller countries. And you have some other uh, aspects that can be more difficult uh, to harmonize, but the, the core structure of the fleet program can be harmonized uh, if you do it correctly. Okay, what are the services that are then more challenging or more complex to harmonize? Okay, yeah, uh, I've thought about this. And for example, uh, I, I've worked in uh, global or in this case, regional RFPs of insurance companies. And uh, you cannot have, or it's difficult to have one vendor, one insurance company in all of the region. And the reason is because if you receive the best option 
of price, service, coverage in one country, probably you won't receive the best option in another country from the same insurance company. So for the second country, it would be difficult or it wouldn't uh, make sense to have the same insurance because mm -hmm. each of the countries would want the same, the, the best offer. That's regarding the insurance and probably also fuel. Uh, the fuel program, it's, uh, it has a lot of potential in terms of spend, as you know, in terms of, of rebates, if you can uh, have one vendor, but it happens kind of, kind of the same. If you have one big player that has a lot of gas stations in their program, in one country, probably it, it doesn't have the same uh, coverage or the same structure in another. So that's kind of uh, one difficulty that I see in the region. Okay, good. Uh, Carlos um, of Geotap, uh, how easy is it to harmonize a telematics program across Latin America? That's a very, very good point and thanks for having me here. So for example, I think because the, the model of telematics is really software that is connected, it's, you can have the same software in every country. So that's actually that helps a lot. In our industry, and I was just thinking about Rodrigo's example of you know fuel and insurance that's so different. For us, it's, it's the same. No, it's the same software, the same solution working everywhere. And uh, comparatively, as maybe in a couple of years ago it was the iPhone, but you say, well, they're the same thing exactly. We do the same. So, so yeah, I, I think it's easier, less of a pain. Okay, um, Pascal. In what way has COVID-19 led to additional complexity? when it comes to harmonization and optimization. I think perhaps that in LATAM we know that there is, let's say, a difficulty or complexity in terms of exchange rates, impact, interest rates and so on. So I can imagine that COVID-19 is perhaps even putting an extra layer on the complexity. Well, the COVID-19 is certainly creating uncertainty. Uh, well, and uncertainty is there also because uh, at present time, Latin America is at the peak of the crisis, not like in Europe where we are coming out. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know when uh, the crisis will, uh, will be over. Um, the complexity in Latin America is that the currency tends to be weak. So there is a depreciation and depreciation has been very high in March in some countries. And then interest rates are also going up. So um, harmonization is difficult. And if on top of that, you're adding uh, movement on interest rate and you're adding uh, depreciation, it's even more difficult to control your costs. Okay. Good. Ricardo, um, have you something to add to what Pascal was saying? Is there something that you can say about the complexity of harmonizing your fleet management across Latin America at the moment? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, as uh, Pascal well mentioned, uh, first of all, we are not at the same level of maturity as in Europe and, and North America. Uh, the, the countries, the GDP of those countries uh, are not at all at the same level as well. So it brings much more complexity on dealing with a such a big disease that affects all the population. So on top of interest rates, uh, the, the OEMs, we can also mention the OEMs. We have big industries in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, much less in Colombia, but Peru, Chile, Bolivia, they don't produce any vehicle. All vehicles need to be imported. And uh, how, how to deal with that? So each country is much different with the other, and uh, for sure COVID-19 uh, brings a lot of complexity for those countries. Okay. Um, Rodrigo, how will your role as a fleet manager change in the new normal? Because you were mentioning, okay, for your company car drivers, it's not easy for your organization. It is complex at the moment. I can imagine that perhaps also your future role will evolve if, for example, there is more and more homeworking, more and more attention for health and safety. So how do you see that? Well, I've seen in the last years the the role of the fleet manager evolving, uh, and it uh, depending on the technology, we see that the technology is impacting us positively most of the times, and the fleet manager is no far from the, from there. So uh, we have now apps for for our 
users uh, to, in our cell phones, even some apps to preventing the employees to use a cell phone while driving. So I see the fleet manager e evolving previously to the COVID-19. Now with the COVID-19, I think that it will impact positively in terms of agility. If the fleet manager had certain ideas, certain um, recommendations that he would do to their senior manage management uh, that could take a long time to, to be approved. Now, because of this, uh, COVID-19 can be authorized uh, more easily because no action would mean a, a impact financially. So you have to move on, you have to uh, flexibilize your fleet program in order to, to achieve or to receive the, 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 the potential benefits that this new normal can bring. Okay. Um, Carlos, do you think that fleet managers, uh, regional fleet managers in Latin America or the fleet managers that you meet with in Latin America, that they are knowledgeable enough in terms of, let's say, answering the challenges, uh, dealing with new technology and so on, so that also their future as a fleet manager is ensured? A very good question, and I was thinking again of those comments in this. Um, I think that there has to be an evolution towards uh, not only fleet manager but more like fleet data manager. There's so many information around coming. You know, we can talk about big data tools, but even like Power BI, all these kind of integrations. There's so many information from so many services that despite you know FMCs are doing a great job of providing more and more information. But in the field manager, they also need to understand and digest every time more information in a remote fashion. So I think they need to become more data-oriented for sure. Okay. Um, another question for Rodrigo. You're quite popular in this first round. What are you missing from your suppliers to further harmonize and strengthen your LATAM fleet strategy? Is there something that you are missing at the moment and that you could really use to further develop your program? Okay, sure. Um, well, uh, to have a, a strengthened fleet program in Latin America, I think that we need to to compare it with what we have in Europe, and probably. Uh, I think that it's missing some uh, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, and plug-in hybrid vehicles, and infrastructure in in the region. So that's uh, the first thing that it's important because. Uh, a lot of companies are uh, considering the CO2 emissions. They are taking green initiatives. So we need to, to keep up and to, to be in the same level in Latin America. Uh, so that's part, that's from the OEMs. Uh, I agree that uh, there's a, a, the data, data management opportunities that we can uh, achieve some more, a, a lot of benefits. And let me tell you that we, we can have good information from the leasing companies. But as you know, sometimes in Latin America, the fleets are, are not only leased, but there's a mix, or sometimes they are even purchased. So we, we as fleet managers receive information from insurance companies, fuel uh, suppliers, uh, leasing or fleet management, uh, OEMs, the, man, the inventory management. So I think that there's a big opportunity to have one option that can integrate all of these elements and uh, allow us to, to manage better the information. Okay. Um, Kent, um, in what way are you ready? Are, let's say, not only ALD, but also the other leasing companies ready, let's say, to serve customers like Rodrigo better when it comes to electrification, new mobility, perhaps also integrated reporting? So I think all the, all the fleet service suppliers, they actually, they have uh, more or less uh, some, some good programs. And in, in, in fact, at least I know uh, plenty of them in, in Latin America. Uh, we all know that it's about data today. Uh, we also need to have some expertise, of course, to, to get advisory to our customers on this. Uh, yes, it's true, as it was mentioned, you know, this green mobility is also driven by, let's say, corporate goals on, on the customer side to reduce the CO2 emissions. Uh, it's also driven in countries by some uh, special tax incentives. You know, in, in Mexico, there's a good incentive to drive a, a hybrid cars and a, an electrical vehicle. But then again, for the plug-in, uh, for the electrical vehicles, we, we don't have the infrastructure really to support that. It's super difficult to get an approval to install a charging uh, point. 
in a corporate uh, parking uh, lot, for example. So, so it, it takes time for the mentality to adjust to that. Uh, we are learning a lot from Europe. We're learning a lot from the United States. Uh, but, but things, you know, a change will come. So it's more a matter of, it's not a matter of if it will come, it will come for sure. But it's more a matter of how, how fast it will come. Uh, so I think we have very good programs, uh, you know, supplying our, our fleet customers. Okay, very good. Um, let's move on to the next topic. Um, that's the adoption of technology for safety and sustainability. And of course, there I need to start with uh, Carlos of Geotap. Carlos, as we move into the new normal, the attention for safety will only increase. But even before the pandemic, you were advocating the importance of technology to enhance safety and also sustainability. Why should safety and sustainability be top of mind for fleet managers with a responsibility in Latin America? I think those two topics are important. Uh, first, the part of safety, not only about the vehicle in terms of asset recovery, the part of the driver behavior, but now also the part of sanitization and basically keeping the vehicle and the driver safe in even continuous times. Uh, we see in our data that the vehicles right now are as being utilized as much as before continuously despite of having now a, a pandemic or a virus there. So technology needs to really be providing the tools to be able to manage this, this usage, no? And, uh, and in the part of sustainability, I'll say that OEMs are producing the electric vehicles. There's new improvements in that part. So we just know that it's gonna be a matter of uh, what percentage of the vehicles can be electric or hybrid today, not if yes or no, it's more about what little percentage that today makes sense already. Okay, uh, Ricardo, um, can we say or can't we say that uh, LATAM is a dangerous country to operate a fleet in, in terms of road safety, vehicle safety, driver safety? It, it depends on the perspective, uh, Stephen. Uh, if we compare to, uh, to the Nordics, for example, it can be dangerous for a Nordics person to say that in that time is dangerous, but uh, if it, you take, we take, uh, we put in the right perspective, uh, I would say it's not dangerous. You just need to to be careful, and uh, we see in from the past years, countries like Brazil that uh, has changed a lot its law, their laws on safety. Uh, so all the vehicles produced by Brazil needs to have double airbags and ABS and also in the upcoming years, ESP, uh, uh, traction control, and so on. We see also on the sustainability, uh, the new rules that are coming, and uh, we have uh, ethanol in Brazil, we see some changes, huge changes in Mexico, with a lot of incentives for electric vehicles and hybrids as well, and uh, we see that, that move. Uh, it, is, it, it is changing, but uh, it will take time. Uh, to, to implement all those things. But it, I wouldn't say it's dangerous. Uh, I think it's a strong word. Good. Uh, would like to come back to Carlos again. Carlos, what are for you the key steps in rolling out and implementing a safety program? I think that the first step is basically to, if you want to be doing a good management, you have to measure things, no? So first you're gonna de design exactly what you wanna achieve, then basically implement that technology and they have a, a follow-up and a feedback. So in this way, you're going to be able to say, in my example of my world, telematics is saying, what are your current levels of safety or accidents and all this kind of accident behavior? And from there, just take the measures and control it and see uh, this improvement towards the baseline. So I, I think with very hard data is the best way to be able to measure that, the benefits, no? Okay. Rodrigo, um, do you have a strict safety program that includes multiple countries in Latin America and how did you go about it to develop it? You need to first uh, define what safety requirements you implement and you require for the cars. And once you have the safety requirements, you need to then go to the next steps. And I think uh, uh, there's an opportunity in the collision and driver assistance that we can have in the vehicles in Latin America. That's one part. Uh, additionally, uh, the safety training program is essential for, for any fleet manager. It's uh, there. You have to make sure that the, the driver that used your car has the skills and the measures to, to be safe 
for his own. So that's why it's important to have a good safety training. Currently, it's there's a tricky part because if you have a behind the wheel uh, program, currently with the pandemic, probably you don't want your drivers to be next to another son. So there's uh, the, the training program could change. Uh, probably you will implement more e-learning, e more uh, uh, virtual training for you for you to have a, a, a correct safety program, and you can do it uh, in all of your, your countries. Okay. Kent, uh, do you see also with your customers that they ask more and more about what they can do and what is possible in terms of safety management and safety training? Yes, sure. I think uh, all uh, corporates, they have a, you know, a corporate social responsibility policy. And of course, the fleet is a, is a big part of that. And it was already mentioned by some of the guys here that, you know, the car is, is one thing. Uh, it's also awareness about you know, the driving. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's about the speeding. It's about the road the conditions, about road safety. Uh, you know, in some countries, uh, you don't even have to take a driving test. Uh, like we do in Europe, for example, to get a driver's license, you know, you start very young with, with and, and then you give in the, the car keys and then you go along. So I think at least we see with some, some customers that, that they actually, you know, they have corporate standards uh, that they put in place because they know that in some of our Latin American countries, the, the, the requirements for a driver are not very high. You know, on our side, uh, we see also that we also advise uh, some of the big corporates that they actually do a driving test. We have suppliers who can who can run a driving test for the drivers before they actually get the car keys for the new leasing cars. Uh, so I think it's, it's very high on the agenda, to be honest. And, and it was there long before COVID-19, uh, but it's definitely there to stay. You know, there's specialized uh, safety driving uh, companies. And I think all the both a, a fleet customer and a, and a fleet service supplier, we work with these uh, specialized uh, agencies and, and, and customers, uh, sorry, suppliers. So, uh, so, so it's a big thing. It's a, and, and there's also some way to go until we actually reach the level of, of the United States and, and Europe. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Carlos, how to adopt the right safety and telematics technology across Latin America? I think that uh, what we always recommend is uh, piloting, try a pilot of technology. You may not be the most savvy person in, in the technology, telematics or whatever, but you test it, you will see how it works. You can put it in your worst case scenario, you know, the, the worst part of your fleet. And then even if, you know, there's different solutions, you compare apples with apples between them. And, and I'm pretty sure you're gonna see a, an improvement in what you were trying to measure. So it's just a matter of piloting, trying, testing, and, uh, and the learning curve is gonna be paying off, no? Okay. Um, Ricardo, uh, don't you have customers that if you talk with them around vehicle telematics, that they have questions about the return on investment, about the cost, and what is then your answer to them? This is a very frequent uh, as, uh, uh, question, Stephen. Um, it, the investment will be paid or not. But I would step back on your question. Uh, what is telematics? Because what we see in LATAM is that uh, telematics is more seen as a track device. And uh, actually it's not. Telematics brings to the company many data uh, to, and you need to be prepared to also analyze all those data. And uh, last but not least, once you have all those data, you need to implement or to take actions. And this is, this is when it comes that uh, you need to be prepared yourself as, as a client, as a company, and have uh, a strong uh, telematics provider and possibly uh, a good fleet manager to analyze all those data and to implement in, inside your company. Okay, thank you. Um, Kent, Rodrigo Monroy already mentioned that he would love to have and to see more c green cars, electric cars in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Does it really make sense to go green and turn your fleet strategy into a green strategy? And if so, how to do it? Yeah, so it, it, again, it, it depends a little bit on the perspective, if it makes sense or not. Uh, I would say it always, you know, from a, from a climate point of view, it, it often does at least because, you know, the fuel consumption is low and less uh, emissions and all this stuff. 
uh, it's tax driven in some countries as well. Uh, it was already mentioned here several times that in Mexico there's a good incentive for, in terms of taxes, for road taxes uh, to go green. Uh, in uh, in Brazil, it's uh, it's a little bit late uh, coming as well. You know, these uh, hybrid cars and electrical vehicles, they were normally imported and, and there's a high import tax. And then let's say the total cost of ownership is not in favor, but still that you, you have a positive impact from from the from the less uh, emissions uh, coming from those cars, uh, we have some uh, some tests all over. That's in America. Uh, we have certain in in Medellin in uh, in Colombia. They are very advanced, so they have a lot of green cars. And whereas in Bogota, it's less. So even within the countries in the region, uh, there's differences. I think both the, the, the fleet owners and, and, and the fleet managers and, and the fleet suppliers, we're all pushing, we're all testing. Uh, some customers, they go only for green cars and they're even ready to pay a small premium to, to drive the green uh, cars. Uh, and, 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 and then there's, of course, customers that, that take the cheapest, the lowest uh, possible price, lowest possible to, to the cost of ownership, and then they go with that. But we see, like we have seen in Europe, we are a little bit behind in Latin America. But as we have seen in Europe, we, we, we start seeing an increase uh, of the green cars. Still, ele electrical, full electrical vehicles, it's, it's less, uh, but, but hybrid cars, it's, 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 coming, uh, it's coming fast now, I think. Okay. Uh, Pascal, um, mm -hmm. you have a global fleet experience. Uh, how do you see the evolution, let's say, of uh, green fleet and electrification in Latin America? But I think you need to consider in Latin America that Brazil is using ethanol and all the cars are equipped with ethanol. So there is not a big push in Brazil for electricity. But in some countries like Kent mentioned, Mexico, Colombia and Chile, there are a lot of initiatives and the fleet managers we are talking to are belonging to companies which are their headquarters in Europe or the US. And one of their first priority is to move to electricity. So I think that uh, this will happen and we can already see uh, some pilots of fuel electric taxis and buses option which are being launched recently a tender in, uh, in Colombia for electric buses. So this will come maybe Brazil a little bit later, but then another issue is a lack of offering from the manufacturers of uh, electric car at accessible prices because this is a bit expensive. But we know that uh, many fleets in, uh, in Mexico are trying to move into uh, hybrid or electric car to avoid the ban that the, government, that the uh, municipality is putting uh, because of contamination. So it will happen as everywhere else in the world. Okay. Um, Carlos, um, again to you. Um, you are, of course, advocating safety and sustainability. You do that via technology, how to make sure that company car drivers are positively responding to the green fleet strategy with the right driver behavior. Do you have any tips? Yeah, yeah of course. I think that first start with a fleet manager, the moment they understand more how this is going to benefit the fleet. And as Pascal said, no, like, it really needs to make sense in terms of the vehicle they're going to be choosing and the TCO and all the part of really making us that, that CO2 part, but also the incentive part of a, a commercial pricing of it. So once the fleet manager understands that it makes sense, then we go towards like the driver. And the driver is really about the first, the policy, that the policy of the company, they need to adapt it. And second, uh, the implementation of it with technology is a part of driver behavior. So you start to implement driver behavior and gamification in the drivers and just start to explain, okay, so you've been using this vehicle, which is a combustion engine, and then they change into a new vehicle and then show the, the, the benefits. One of the biggest benefits we've seen so far is that the part of maintenance, so it's going to be way less maintenance in these kinds of vehicles, you know, because there's less components in the overall. So we see that actually the drivers like it more at the end and they have to be less time in the maintenance shop with money you spend less money. So there's a really good light at the end of the tunnel. It's just to be able to follow them with policies and driving behavior to understand how they can be adapting and learning more. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to the next topic. Um, Ricardo, is it recommended to operate with a strong standardized car policy across LATAM? And is it feasible? 
I wouldn't say strong car policy, but uh, actually I see that in the past years, there's, there's been, uh, we are moving quite fast in LATAM in, uh, in, in that topic, in fleet harmonization. And uh, one of the topics, uh, there are many items to, that can be harmonized in, in Latin America. Uh, one of them, for sure, uh, is uh, who is eligible or not. Uh, we also need to consider uh, the, the financing mode. We have different financing. If we look at fleet management in Latin America, there's different ways of financing your fleet. Uh, we have open and lease. Uh, hybrid system in Mexico, close and lease in the rest of the countries. We look at Argentina, high inflation. Uh, but even though uh, you can harmonize the way that you finance your fleet, you can also harmonize your CO2 emissions, like Pascal just mentioned about Brazil on ethanol. Uh, we have incentives in Mexico, uh, Colombia, and Chile as well. So those are the things that uh, can be harmonized. Yes, yeah, Stephen. Okay, um, Kent, um, what are the, for you the particularities regarding car policies in Latin America? Can you share some things that you have seen uh, within your experience in Latin? Yeah, so it's it, as, as Ricardo mentioned, it's uh, it's not you know it's not uh, all or nothing. Uh, it's, you still have you know Latin America is is a huge uh, is a huge uh, region. Uh, we fly between Mexico and, and Sao Paulo in nine or ten hours, so so the region is 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 big. So it's you know it's not exactly the same, but we can of course uh, we can of course uh, let's say adjust a com company car policy uh, to the region. Uh, but but again, it, it goes down also to to local specific uh, local uh, incentives. You know, we talked a lot about taxes, ethanol, and all this stuff. Uh, there are some uh, some fleet, uh, some of our big customers. They actually have by themselves. They have big uh, agreements with the OEMs where they buy uh, two or three uh, makes and, and then they try to do that. Uh, we have uh, leading OEMs uh, differently in all the countries, so, so they, are, they are also strong in one country, maybe less strong in another country. Um, uh, so, so we can harmonize, but, but you know, we don't recommend it to do it black and white because mm -hmm. then it, the total cost of ownership will not uh, be able to justify that. Uh, but we can definitely have, you know, we can have petrol cars, we can have even diesel cars, we can have green cars in all the countries. Uh, but, but it's more if it actually then makes sense if it's, let's say, if, 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 the, if the equation is strong enough to do that on a regional level or it's more, we can have some 20% flexibility to actually adjust to the local specifics of that uh, individual country. Still the biggest fleet market in, in the region is it's Brazil, uh, Mexico and Argentina. So of course, you know, whatever rules in those uh, three countries, that's that's you know, they have more weight in in the Latin America American uh, car policy. Uh, but, but of course, you know, still uh, many of the countries uh, in the in the region here, they're a huge country. You know, Colombia is it, a big country, so a lot of weight as well. Um, but yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, we can definitely uh, we can definitely advise. Okay. Um, Rodrigo, are you planning, uh, due to the pandemic, for example, to extend your car policy that you have with some uh, add-ons like uh, things around home working or flexible working and so on that you also need to include now perhaps with the car policy that you have? Well, uh, for sure we know that uh, some changes will come. We need to adapt to the needs of our users. So definitely uh, we will consider those needs. Uh, if a sales representative needs to uh, some additional safety uh, inside their, their cars uh, for due to the pandemic, if he will use less the car, uh, we will uh, talk to our vendors to see how we, how flexible we can be and to adapt to th those needs. Uh, we, we know that they will use more uh, virtual uh, conferences. They won't uh, visit so often the, the doctors. So yeah, we cannot stay the same uh, due to this, all these changes that we are seeing. Okay. Um, again, going to Kent, how to deal with the fact that not all car brands and their networks are present and equally developed 
across Latin America? Because I can imagine Rodrigo was mentioning it in the beginning. Uh, optimizing, harmonizing OEMs, leasing vendors is one of the first things that you can consider. But we all know that you mentioned it also that not all car manufacturers are um, present in the same way, in the sa at the same level in each of the of the countries. So how to deal with that? Yeah, so I think it's it's, it's where actually we as as leasing service or fleet management service providers, uh, uh, you know, we have few here in the call. It's it's where you know we should we have an obligation to show our true value because we have the expertise. Uh, not only at regional level, not even only at national level, but also, uh, you know, in, in regions of, of the specific countries. It, it, you know, we should not deliver, I don't know, 50 cars to uh, 50, I don't know, Chevrolet cars to a region where there's no, uh, there's no Chevrolet uh, service uh, points, uh, so we cannot maintain the cars. Uh, we need to, uh, we, we need to, 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 the customers say, okay, we want uh, a specific brand. Yes, we understand it's, it's, uh, it's, it makes sense in terms of the cost of uh, ownership in, in a capital, for example, but in that region where you need the cars, it doesn't make sense because you cannot maintain the car. Uh, or there's maybe there's problems with, with spare parts, you know, during this COVID-19, of course, we have seen a lot of the OEMs actually having to, to stop uh, production of both cars and spare parts. Uh, so there's constant monitoring on, on our side as well to make sure, you know, what are the supply chains? Are they open now? Are they not open? Uh, of course, also with with you know with crisis comes opportunities. So so the OEMs they are super desperate to get some cars sold. So so there's some good deals also now to to get for new cars. But then again, the whole supplier network around those new cars it needs to be in place. Uh, you know, many of these car dealerships and and and, and service points they are. They are not owned by the OEMs themselves. They are private uh, business people having those uh, dealerships. But at least when I walk around in, in Mexico City, I see a lot of the show, showrooms. They have actually closed down now, and then the showrooms they are up for rent. So, so the you know it has an impact also for for the network of, of the car dealers. Uh, you know we do uh, we do an update uh, regularly that we share with customers to, so they are informed. You know what is actually going on with with the with the OEMs on, on that side as well. Uh, so it's, I would say, right now, things are moving fast. Okay, good. Um, Carlos, how to deal with differences in cultural preferences across LATAM? I can imagine that also it's not one country. Also, the people probably have some other priorities and cultural preferences. How to deal with that in a fleet management setup? I'm going to say it's, uh, it's fun. <laughs> for sure. Uh, we have this old concept, you know, like local, like global and local. So we've really seen in our side that it's about having local partners uh, that, you know, also FNCs have. You know, they have this local partner who can be able to speak the local language, understand the local taxing, understand everything, you know, in terms of currency and everything's happening. So really the cultural preferences is to really be local, be local with that place and then you move to the next country, you also will be again local. So once you are having the local slang and be able to speak with them, it's when really you get business done. It's amazing for us and for some me, being a Mexican, when I start to go to Brazil to understand how it's all different and even in spite of the language, uh, there's this whole Latin America essence of being more, you know, candid and more, you know, more, more con but at the same time that it's, uh, it's different business. So. Also that you always need to be local and, and solve it by the local needs. Good. Um, the next topic will tackle long-term commitments or flexible partnerships. And let me start with Ken Biertrup. Uh, Ken, first of all, can you briefly explain how the pandemic has impacted the vehicle leasing industry in LATAM? We heard from Rodrigo Monroy before um, about what for him are the challenges, but you can also comment on what the impact is for the leasing industry. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so of course, this uh, let's say the the pandemic has has made a huge impact. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that that there's difficulties to actually register cars and deregister the used cars. It, it's something that impacts. It's also our customers say they, they see a, a lot of uncertainty uh, coming forward. Uh, they might hesitate uh, customers to to commit to uh, to a three or four year lease of, of a new car. 
Uh, some customers, they prefer actually to keep the existing cars for, for additional 6, 12, or 24 months, uh, for example. Some, they would like to, to have, let's say, oh, maybe new car, but only for six months. Uh, so we do a lot of these flexible lease terms now. Uh, something, again, we have adapted from Europe. It's a big thing uh, these days in Europe, and it's coming soon, uh, or coming now, actually, to, to Latin America. So it's something that we are implementing, and yeah, we have already done Chile, Peru, and Colombia, and on, on with, with success, uh, there's a huge demand for that right now. Um, we have always done flexibility in, in the lease offer we have in terms of uh, contract modification, duration and all this stuff, the early termination and all this stuff. But it's more like the, the flexible lease product now, it's more like a, a short term rent. You basically you pay, the, pay the, the rent or the lease of the car for the day that you actually drive the car. It's not necessarily for the customer that he or she needs only the car for a few days or it's more the, the mental, uh, let's say, flexibility that we offer. You can easily end up driving three years in, in that car, but, but the customer would know all along that the day I don't need the car, I can get out of the lease commitment uh, from, with one day's notice. And I think that gives a lot of mental flexibility for the customer. So they don't need, oh, okay, I, I cannot, uh, I'm committed to this lease for, for three years. Uh, and, and they know there is a, a penalty to, to exit that uh, long-term contract. Um, so we do a lot of these, uh, these, we, we need to help, you know, we also here to help each other, mm. you know, uh, we are supplier, we're long-term a partner of our customers. So of course we need also to help our customers uh, when they need us uh, now. Okay. Uh, Pascal, how do you see the race to flexibility for the vehicle leasing companies in Latin America? Well, I, I fully agree with what Kent has been saying. Uh, meaning that in terms of uncertainty, people are looking for flexibility, but at the same time, they are not eager to change too quickly. The uh, maximum of a change would be to get a car allowance, to get a car when you want. But I think that this is a bit of a dream, and I don't think that this will be happening, because one of the major threats of COVID is to be infested. So people are still happy to have their own car. So I think that the flexibility that we will see in the near future is the one that Kent has been describing. So keeping your car a bit longer or getting a contract a bit shorter. Then a lot of people will be discussing and trying to find a combination of different possibilities. But this will be a medium term future. And I think for now we are still uh, in uh, living in the same way that we used to be to live in the past. Very good. Ricardo, um, some of the um, leasing companies, many leasing companies in Europe, are suggesting extending leasing contracts to their customers to overcome some of the financial challenges, the delivery challenges for new vehicles and so on during the pandemic. Um, how long do you think that you need and can propose to your customers such contract extensions? Or do you think that it will even be, let's say, more of a permanent element that contracts can perhaps evolve to become longer? Steven, pretty good question, actually. And this is not only related to COVID-19. Uh, we, uh, we need to, to take in consideration that uh, in LATAM, the, the market's not so mature. And we see that uh, Leasing contracts are uh, renting, uh, long-term rental. And uh, when I began in that market about 15 years ago, the average contract duration in Brazil was 12 months. So when we talk about contract extension, I think that uh, this is in a natural way. And this is how uh, large uh, fleet management companies like ELD, Yerval, uh, we have that as a core product uh, based on TCO. And since vehicles, uh, and many employees are working from home, we have less mileage. Having less mileage, uh, it's a good way to say, let's extend your contract because you're not using what you, are, you have subscribed. So it's natural. And uh, uh, also the, the part of that topic that we are discussing is long-term relationship. And the long-term relationship is based not only on things that are doing well, but when we have issues or problems like we have now, and we need to work together to find the best solution. And one of the best solutions is for, for our clients uh, to pay what they are getting. 
and uh, if they are not running uh, with the vehicles, it's it's natural to say to extend the contracts and make high contracting. Yes. Okay, um, Rodrigo Monroy, are you in favor of extending your leasing contracts, and or are you, let's say, in favor and positive about more flexible solutions for your fleet? I think both. <laughs> what I think in the short term, uh, companies will extend their contra contracts for some months, probably six months, and then they will evaluate and uh, to see what's happening and recalibrate. The uh, uh, companies will will see how the sales are internally, what's the budget that they will have, and then to see really what will be the, the need of the of the company. And at the end, uh, probably the best approach in the midterm will be to have flexible contracts, because if you don't have certainty in the amount of miles that you will have in the period of time that will be the best for you to use, uh, you will probably choose a flexible contract. Thank you. We need to move on to the final topic of this uh, panel discussion and there I would like to start with Pascal. Um, Pascal, um, COVID-19 of course has an important impact on fleet management but also let's say on the way that we are using mobility and that perhaps some trends are emerging into the markets. So the question for you is could it be that in a less mature market like LATAM that the return to the new normal with the impact of COVID-19 will perhaps accelerate some of the trends that the market is not really ready for. Yeah, so that is a possibility. Uh, what I would like to uh, underline is the success of some mobility in uh, initiative before the COVID. Because Latin America is probably around the world the continent where e-healing solutions have been uh, most successful. If you take, for, in for instance, Uber, they claim to have around 40 million active users, 1 million drivers, and a presence in 200 cities. You take 99, the competitor of Uber, they claim 15 million customers, 300,000 drivers just in Brazil. And then you take Cabify, which is the third one, they've got uh, 14 million users and have a presence in more than uh, 100 cities. So e-healing solutions are really working very well in Latin America for many reasons. One is public transportation is not very good and safety is very bad on regular taxis. Then you take the uh, bike, bikes and electric scooters. You've got a company called Grow Mobility, which is a market leader in Latin America they claim to have more than 10 million rides and a presence in 23 cities and more than 100,000 devices. So there are a lot of solutions happening in Latin America for many reasons. Traffic jams in the big cities, safety reasons which we talk about. And there is a last one which I think is very peculiar to Latin America, which is what we call BRT for Bus Rapid Transit. And this is traditional bus running on rail stations uh, to avoid uh, traffic jams. So we can see that there are plenty of initiative and I think, and this is interesting to listen to our participant, how a fleet manager will use uh, those possibilities and how leasing company will merge company cars with other solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's then go to Rodrigo Monroy. Rodrigo, what kind of new mobility solutions are on your list next to the company car? Well, as I mentioned, we cannot, we as fleet managers can adapt. And one example of this is, for example, in Mexico City, when we had this uh, pollution restriction and we couldn't use in some days up to 40% of our cars. So we moved rapidly and we did use uh, the, op the hailing uh, options such as Uber, Lyft. Uh, so future, I think that that's uh, some possibility 
but in, in terms of safety we can we can we have to be careful no i think that uh, we would need to make sure that we use the, the correct uh, vendors to take the correct measures uh, because if you put your employees if you offer them some other kind of mobility uh, but without taking in account the, the safety measures can be uh, dangerous so yeah we will be able to use some additional uh, t uh, options for example bike is uh, starting to to be used in a lot of uh, cities and, and also the, the transportation publicly they are open roads for to use of bicycle so yeah definitely uh, we can uh, adapt we can do these kind of options because yeah as i mentioned we cannot see as as before okay um carlos um is safety also for you the biggest let's say issue or the main component in yes or no the success of new alternative mobility solutions across latin america I think safety for sure is important, and especially as Pascal said, when you're gonna go in a bus with your other 200 people as usual. But there's, there's also other components because right now, example, all the restaurants that were not able to deliver products because they were closed, this kind of last mile delivery, it's, it's expanding crazy. So this is a kind of trend that are gonna be moving the right hailing or products of thing. It's not only, and if you see the app of Uber today, Uber is showing that they are delivering people and also products. So they became a, a last mile delivery company. And in our world, we had a chance to be able to sort of fulfill all these kind of companies in the back of the, in the commercial platform, you know, as, as, as telematics. So we see how they are using these new trends and technologies to grow faster than ever. So, so maybe some businesses were stopped or were paused, but these kind of technologies and these kind of uses has grown dramatically. Thank you. Um, Kent, how do you envision the adoption of subscription-based mobility and ride-hailing services in Latin America? So Yeah, so as it was already mentioned, I, I think you know, the, the, the ride-hailing is, is already a massive su uh, success here. And, and as we see subscription also in Europe and the United States, uh, we will see that here as well. Um, I would say the, 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 the Right now, with the COVID nineteen, it seems like the the let's say the interest and the need and the and the demand for for car sharing is has actually decreased uh, quite a lot because you know when we share the the vehicle, then there's an increased uh, risk uh, to to get infected. Um, at least you know we have been uh, looking at a few options for for the car sharing, but we have uh, put it on hold for the time being because uh, there's close to zero demand on, on that one. Uh, so yeah, the the, the right hailing of Uber, Capify, and and the likes uh, that's that's a big thing. Uh, subscribing it could also be from the car manufacturers. It could be, of course, from from our self leasing uh, suppliers or, or fleet management suppliers. Um, still, to do it short term, then it would more be like six months. So then it's it could be a mix of the flexible solution again uh, uh, with a s subscription instead, but but. Car sharing, as, as we thought six months ago, would be the next big thing. Uh, at least for the time being, that's not uh, that's not high in demand. Uh, we have to admit. Okay, um, Ricardo. And what about micro mobility? Is that something where you expect a lot from? Yes, yes. We saw Pascal shared some big numbers from uh, Grow Mobility, one of the largest uh, micro mobility companies in, in Latam. Uh, before COVID-19. So in my opinion, I expect that even af now and after uh, all these crises, uh, it's, it's a way to go uh, because public transportation is not up to speed. Uh, vehicles are expensive for the majority of the population. And big cities, we have a lot of traffic. And uh, that's why microbillability, I think it's the, the trend uh, that we will see from the future. But we cannot forget that for that, we need uh, investment from the government with uh, cycle lanes uh, because on the other hand we have safety issues as well because uh, going in a scooter in Lima, Peru can be quite dangerous. Okay. Um, gentlemen, to end this panel discussion, we are going to give you just one sentence and that sentence is what according to you is the number one thing that a global fleet manager needs to know in order to secure 
a healthy and efficient fleet strategy across Latin America. And I would like to start with Rodrigo. What is your main tip? Well, I think that the, as a fleet manager, you need to all the information. There, uh, to uh, get a puzzle done, you need all the pieces of the puzzle. So you have to get them all together, get all the information, and get the puzzle done as fleet in, in Latin America. Okay. Pascal, what is your main tip? Be practical. Try to harmonize, but if you can't, make sure you get the best price and the best solution for your guys. Okay, very good. Kent? Uh, work with an experienced, uh, preferably an international leasing uh, supplier with expertise, uh, with some uh, coverage either directly or with some partners. Uh, I think they can give you a lot of insights into how, you know, things also down to the small details actually already in, in the region yeah. okay ricardo uh, i would say uh, a little bit of uh Rodrigo Morhoi just said get the puzzle done and by doing that be closer to your teams you need to understand uh your your local the local specifics from from each country okay and then finally carlos I will say that part that we commented at the beginning, the part of being a fleet data manager, there's so many things happening right now, so many information that the more they digest it and they take decisions on, on that, it will be a lesson. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, my tip is to be virtually present for the 2020 Fleet LATAM conference on 29 and 30 September. Indeed, after their successful first edition in Mexico last year, we would have loved to meet again face to face, but of course the pandemic acts as a major restraint. Which is why, together with our sponsor Geotap, thank you very much Carlos, we have decided to go virtual with the Fleet LATAM conference this year. 100% virtual, 100% efficient and 100% accessible for global, regional and local fleet decision makers as the entrance is free of charge upon registration. With different formats, like panel discussions and webinars, this conference will focus with a positive spirit on safety on the first day, on 29 September, safety of the people, safety of the cars you manage, and safety on the road. The second day, on 30 September, looks at fleet management opportunities with a focus on connectivity, electrification and mobility. Also topics that we discussed today. So three key ingredients for a successful fleet latter management in the new normal. So Carlos, how happy are you that we can indeed continue the fleet LATAM conference 2020, of course, in a virtual way? I think it will be great. We had a lot of momentum the last year. We saw so many good fleet managers and companies in the industry being together. So if the new normal right now is to be online, let's do it. Because let's keep the momentum, let's keep learning. So we are happy to be in this part of this journey. Okay. And of course, we hope also to the other gentlemen that you will be present and that we can count on your support. So once again, thank you for your insights and your contribution to this panel discussion. And ladies and gentlemen, dear fleet manager, this virtual element will also be part of this year's Fleet Europe Awards competition with the Global Fleet Manager of the Year Award. Where before we had mandatory face-to-face -face meetings with the finalists and the jury, we will now, of course, organize this jury meeting in a virtual way maximizing the efficiency, responding to the travel restrictions and increasing the possibility for you to join the award ceremony at the Fleet Europe Summit on 17 and 18 November. So we are looking forward to your participation. You can always contact me if you would like to have more information and so looking forward to your application. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed our first ever virtual global fleet conference preparing for the new normal. Once again, thank you for your presence and support. It was a pleasure being your moderator and I wish you a safe 
and healthy global fleet journey. Take care. Goodbye.